Hi, my name is Lauren Templeton, and you are listening to Investing the Templeton Way. This podcast is for anyone interested in learning more about investing. In this podcast, I will be interviewing some of the greatest minds from the investment community and exploring topics ranging from international markets to behavioral finance. To learn more, please visit us at investingthetempletonway.com. The information presented in this podcast or available on the website is not intended as and shall not be construed as financial advice. This podcast is produced for entertainment value. Investing is inherently risky, and I encourage you to seek financial advice from a professional who is aware of the facts and circumstances of your individual situation. Thanks for listening. Today's guest is Monish Pabrai. Monish is the managing partner of the Pabrai Investment Funds. He's well known for his Buffett-like style in investing, and he's a quote-unquote shameless cloner. Um, so today I'm hoping to talk to Monish about his investment philosophy, his background, and his wonderful philanthropic endeavors, the Dakshana Foundation. So welcome, Monish. Thank you, Lauren. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you. I have a, a lot of respect for you as a as an investor, and I think as one of the very few women investors, and that's wonderful to see. Well, now there are a few of us. You have a daughter in the investment industry. Is that correct? Yeah, but still very underrepresented, you know. And I think actually women, uh, I think, temperamentally make better investors. There is some evidence to suggest that returns from women are actually higher due to the low turnover and portfolios managed by women, which is often attributed to a lack of confidence or overconfidence bias on the male side, uh, which is very interesting. But since you brought up women and in investing, tell me how you got your daughter interested in investing. Actually, uh, you know, I have uh, two kids, two daughters. Mm-hmm. I never, ever tried to influence either of them to go into investing or become investors or even spend much time talking about investing and such. What I always uh, encourage them to do, and what was my focus uh, and my wife's focus when when they were growing up, is that we wanted them to uh, hone in and focus on what they thought was their natural calling. And I thought my job as a parent was to help in the discovery of that calling. Yeah, so uh, I just assumed that. Uh, it's it's not going to be investing. And then the younger one doesn't have much interest in, in investing and such. Monsoon actually surprised me. And uh, when she uh, expressed an interest and then she went to work for a Asia hedge, hedge fund. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then actually when I started to uh, look at how she approached things, I actually found that uh, her approach was actually superior to mine. And, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah. How is that? Well, I mean, I think that I think there are there are inborn traits mm-hmm. and then there are what I would call learned traits. I think in investing, if you if you try to go against what is your natural grain and your natural temperament, uh, that's an uphill battle. And so the uh, you know, who we are as people and what are traits are and all of that, that is hard coded at the age of five or six. Uh, So between our genetics and what happens in the first five or six years of our life, who we are at the age of six and the age of 96 is not going to change much. So basically, if if you're a hyperactive person who needs a a lot of action, generally speaking, you're not going to do really well in value invest. Mm-hmm. I think I think Monsoon has, what I noticed is she has two traits that are much stronger in her than they are in me. One trait is she hates to sell anything. She absolutely hates to trade. 
which is a great trait. And the, uh, the, uh, the second trait is she's very biased towards very high quality. So she, she wants to find and buy these extremely high quality businesses and then never touch them. And what could be simple? Well, th- those those are really great personality traits. It reminds me of a quote from one of your favorite books, 100 to 1 in the Stock Market by Thomas Feltz. And he has a great quote. I can't recall it right off the top of my head, but it's about um, the tendency for investors to sell investments too soon and that you should leave them in the portfolio. Um, yeah, I think, I think that, quote is, that quote is something like every – sell decision is an investing mistake. Mm-hmm. Basically, basically his, uh, I guess where he's coming from, he's saying, look, if you bought it right, it would never need to be sold. Mm-hmm. Scott and I have gone back and looked at all of our buy and sell decisions over the course of our history. And I would say the most common error we make is in selling securities. So I do think there's a lot of validity there. And it's just really exciting that your daughter has gone into the investment business. She was at Dalton, I believe, and now has launched her own fund, Drew Investment Fund. And I wish her a lot of success. It gives me great joy to see the two of you together at different investment conferences As you know, or you may know, that my dad really influenced me, and we're terrific friends. So it's wonderful to see that relationship and another father-daughter team, so to say. Yeah, and actually, this is a dimension to our relationship uh, that I never expected, right? I mean, because Mm -hmm. it was not part of the game plan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like, I think that uh, Monsoon and I have, have been in different, you know, we, we visited a, a lot of companies together. Uh, I used to just take her along. Like, you know, one time I was going to China to speak in, at Peking University, I think 2017 or something. Mm-hmm. And I asked her if she wants to come. Uh, you know, I was thinking of it more in terms like a China trip for her. Or whatever. And, uh, and Guy was coming there too. Guy Spear. And, uh, and then uh, the folks at Peking University they they uh, arranged a translator and a guy who knew Mao Tai really well. And at that time, I had an investment in Mao Tai. And uh, so we flew to the middle of nowhere in China from, from Beijing. And he spent a day at, at Mao Tai. And, and you know, the, the thing is that I had bought Mao Tai many years before that. Monsoon uh, went and bought Mao Tai after the trip and i i thought it was really expensive at that point you know and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and such but you know she bought it and then later this is short maybe a year or so later after that trip lilu called me and said look uh, i know when we bought mount high we were going to hold it forever but there's stuff going on and uh, it needs to be sold and uh, so he said i just want to let you know that i'm going to be selling and uh, and I've already been selling and so on. So I said, well, if God is selling, then who am I? <laughs> <Right. You know? laughs> Lee Lu calls you and tells you to sell. You might want to think about it. So uh, one femtosecond second after that call, I placed my Mao Tai sell orders. And, uh, and none of this data meant anything to Monsoon. I, I talked to her about it. It just bounced off her. And... Till today, she has not sold Mao Tai. And as it turned out, uh, I think Lilu and I sold at like uh, seven or 800 or 900 RMB per share. It's over 2000 per share now. So whatever was bothering him didn't seem to affect the core franchise the way he thought it might, uh, might have affected it. And uh, Monsoon, I think when, when she went to that trip, and she saw the place. Uh, I mean, it was very, it was extremely clear on that trip that this was a very, very special business. This was a business where the cost of goods sold was less than $2 and the selling price was like $1,200. Uh, this incredible business. Unreal. And, um, and uh, she, she understood that 
she didn't care what I was saying and she didn't care what Dilu was saying and she still owns it. Wow. So she had the conviction to stand pat. Very uh, strong conviction. Yeah, it was really surprising for me to see that was really surprising. Now, Monish, my guests may not know that in 2007, you purchased a lunch with Warren Buffett for about $650,000. You were the top bidder. And I believe you took your girls with you on that lunch. So how how old would the girls have been at that time? They were uh, 10 and 12 years old at the time. <laughs> and I, I actually think it was the absolutely perfect age. It just happened that they were at that age. Uh, I had been trying to win that auction for a few years and I kept failing. And then she finally prevailed in 2007. And uh, and basically, I think that, so when we had that lunch, they sat on either side of of, of Warren. And, uh, and, you know, he was having a lot of like side conversations with the two of them. Like, I think he, he pulled out a, a Johnny Rockets card from his wallet and he shows it to both of them and says, look, uh, I, this, the holder of this card is entitled to lifetime free burgers at Johnny Rocket <laughs> for him and his friends. I, I mean, he must have made some offer to buy the business. It didn't work. And maybe they gave him that uh, card as a consolation prize. I'm not sure what the history was. But then he says that there's a Johnny Rockets in Irvine. And mm-hmm. uh, when I come to Irvine, we're going to go to Johnny Rockets and we're going to order one of everything from that. You know, because it's all free. <laughs> so, oh my goodness! <laughs> so I mean, anyway, I mean, I think the the thing is like one of the things he said to them at the lunch was he said that the most important decision you will make in your lives is who you decide to marry, and and you know they were not of married marriageable age at that time, right? Twelve years old. They still remember that really clearly. And oh, no. uh, and that had that sentence had a much greater impact on them than one million other sentences or their mom and I have said to them, you know. So uh, well, that's so a we lot of to, pressure. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I think that uh, I think they have dwelled on that sentence quite a bit over mm-hmm. the years, and I think they're both very uh, they're very smart about their uh, their dating choices. Well, that's that's very good. I will advise the same of my girls. That's really good advice. Actually, uh, yeah, it's I think I think like I said, you know, just if I ignore everything else about the lunch, that alone is worth many times what we paid for. Absolutely. What what other valuable advice did you take away from the lunch? Well, you know, uh, Warren, you know, one of the things, you know, this year for example was the last year the lunch was auctioned. And this year it went for the lowly price of like 19 million or something. One of Warren's big focuses at these lunches is that he wants to make sure that the winners or the buyers of these lunches feel that they got a bargain. So he tries really hard to try to add as much value as he can. I mean, I'll give you another example. I'll be very direct. Someone invited me to a lunch they had won with Eric Schmidt, you know, the used to be the CEO of Google. Right. And uh, and uh, we met Eric in on the Google campus. We went to the cafeteria mm-hmm. and then we went to like a private conference room. I mean, you know, there's no comparison between the two. He's a he's a very good guy, but this ethos of wanting to have the winner think he got a bargain was not part of the equation in his mind. Uh, I don't think it'd be part of the equation in most people who, you know, offer these charity lunches. But so one of the things Warren said to us when we started, he said, look, I have nothing going on all afternoon. I'm here with you guys for as long as you want. And he says, when you're completely bored of me and you want me to leave, just let me know and I'll leave. Okay, so he didn't (laughs) set a time frame for the lunch. After about two hours and 45 minutes, you know, we said, you know, I think we're done here. And uh, we were the ones who ended the meeting, not him. And uh, the lunch covered, I think later I made some notes, I think 54 different questions and a very wide ranging set of topics. And uh, yeah, tremendous, tremendous value addition 
like i mean i think like one of the things uh he would he would take anything i mentioned or anything any of the people asking questions mentioned and he would try to answer it in a way that would add tremendous value so we i would add as ask these you know a uh, very kind of basic questions i said look i don't know what happened to rick gorin you know mm-hmm. uh we knew he was with you guys in the 70s we knew the three of you did a bunch of deals together in the 60s and 70s but he kind of fell off the face of the earth after that so i asked him what happened to rick are you in touch with him he said oh yeah i'm in touch with rick i play bridge with him all the time i just got a you know i get holiday cards from him all of that right yeah and uh, and then he proceeds to talk about the 73 74 period when uh, rick got margin calls and it was a big drop in the stock market at, at that time i think one of the biggest drops mm-hmm. and rick was forced to sell his berkshire hathaway shares to warren uh, at the time <laughs> for 40 dollars a share which is where they were changing hands at that time which is now over 400,000 i mean goodness and uh, and and you know he he said look if you're even a slightly above average investor and you spend less than you earn uh and you use no leverage you cannot help but get very wealthy over a lifetime okay it's true i mean just think about that you know that how simple is that right you take out leverage from the equation you be patient and you just you know go at it one one day at a time and compounding works it does the magic ingredient is time i always tell uh, investors we have some control over the rate of return not as much as we'd like but that that magic ingredient really is time and if you remove leverage from the equation you're taking away something that could pos- potentially take you out of the game which is um not helpful when you're trying to compound but compounding is truly magical now w- i know that what came out of that lunch you have a special friendship with charlie munger correct well i think the lunch was like buy one and get in for <laughs> when i was you know bidding for the lunch and i talked to my wife and you know she said well you know this is like you know kind of a bit ridiculous and yeah. uh, but she said you want to do it go for it and later she said you know other than marrying me it was the best thing you ever did you know like the smartest thing you ever did so um <laughs> anyway the, the 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 thing is that yeah warren was joking at the lunch I mean I think what happened is I I mentioned to Warren that my wife uh, my ex-wife now but my wife at the time Harina she was obviously a fan of his but her true love and life was, was Charlie <laughs> and Warren got really competitive and and he said that well you know Charlie's is really old boring guy uh <laughs> between the two of us I'm far more interested <laughs> and you would not really enjoy hanging out with Charlie and he said just to prove that i'm going to set up both of you guys to meet charlie for lunch and then you're going to know who's the who's the more interesting guy so i thought he's just you know kind of joking about it right and then a couple of days later i get a copy on an email from warren's assistant to charlie's assistant basically saying hey i met this couple they were wonderful and i really enjoyed meeting them and i think you'll enjoy meeting them and they seem to have the miss misunderstanding that you're more interesting than me that is also going to get cleared up when you meet them <laughs> so uh please set up to meet them for lunch okay mm-hmm. so, so then then uh, we met charlie for lunch and the funny thing is i found the munger lunch way more interesting than the buffett really you know and uh i think the thing is that warren still has a veneer of diplomacy when he's uh, sure meeting anyone i think he just assumes if he meets anyone everything's in the public domain you know it's yes. going to be and charlie actually really doesn't have those filters uh so it's like what you see is what you get yes and uh, so i found the conversation much more you know kind of without boundaries uh with charlie and and it was just wonderful so and then you know we hit it off and then i started to meet him every few months for lunch, for dinner usually at his place 
and then uh, uh, after that, I think his uh, I used to meet him for la- for bridge, lunch and bridge on Fridays at the LA Country Club, uh, and uh, basically I I was a substitute. So when one of the old people couldn't get out of bed, they they'd call me. So I told him, listen, you call me Thursday night or Friday morning, and I'll just drive over. I don't need advance notice, and um, so those use those. Uh, bridge and lunch afternoons used to go from like noon to about 5 or 6 p.m. And uh, and the funny thing is, you know, Rick Gorin was one of the bridge partners. And so Rick would show up. And so now I got all my questions about Rick answered directly by him. Wow. So, uh, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, it was really surreal because I'd, I'd be sitting there at the LA Country Club and sitting across from me would be Charlie and Rick. And uh, I'd like to have to pinch myself. I agree. I would have to pinch myself. Um, I definitely think you got your money's worth out of that lunch um, with friendships that have been with you for many years and lots of contacts. I'm sure you've learned a lot um, from from all of that. I wanted I was hoping you could share a bit with the audience about your childhood. You grew up in India, correct? Yeah, I grew up in India. That's right, in Mumbai and Delhi. And what year did you leave India? Yeah, so I left India when I was 16. I I spent uh, about two years in Dubai. Uh, oh. I finished high school in Dubai. And uh, and then, uh, then after that, actually, I tried to go back to India for college, but there were strikes and such in the college I joined. And so my, my dad was very keen that we should go to the U S for our education. So came back to Dubai and then applied to U S university. So basically lost a year, but then I, I came to South Carolina after that for my undergrad. Yes. That's always, I I will always remember that about you, that you went to Clemson in South Carolina. I don't know why. Just like you, I'm from the deep South. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so, so funny. I have been to Clemson once to watch a football game. It was a big deal. But tell me a bit about your parents in India. What were they like? You know, uh, so both my parents have passed away. And, um, you know, uh, obviously, we, we all look look up to our parents as role models. And uh, we all think that we had the, the most of us think we had the greatest parents. I think in my case, I was especially blessed. So there were a couple of things that happened. Uh, I would say it wasn't designed that way, but it happened by accident. Uh, So my dad was this entrepreneur who was really, really good at identifying, offering gaps in the market and creating businesses that went after those those Mm -hmm. niches. And and he was extremely good at starting from zero. Like all the businesses he started, uh, they were usually after a bankruptcy. He had no money, and he would magically get things going with nothing. And but he was also a, an eternal optimist. And so the common theme in all these businesses was that they would, he would usually be right about the opportunity. Uh, some of these businesses scaled to a few hundred employees. And, wow. uh, but he was, he would always try to grow as fast as possible. They were always very highly levered with almost no equity. And then when the first headwinds showed up, it would crumble like a house of cards. Mm. And what was amazing about both my parents is that, you know, they were, one of their vices were they were very poor savers. So pretty much they spent whatever they, 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 they earned. And so when the bad times came, there was no money for rent or groceries or anything. And uh, they would literally hit bottom. Uh, business going away meant that we directly personally had a lot of financial issues. Mm-hmm. Um, after the age of, I think, 11 or 12, my dad started treating my brother and me as his kind of de facto board of directors. <laughs> and and when, especially when the business was in trouble, we'd we'd have we'd sit down at night and we'd have to figure out how to make it last for one more day wow. and then we'd make it last for one more day and then the next night we'd look, try to figure out how how to make it last for one more day again right and uh so i and when i was 15 or 16 i started going on sales calls with him so 
I I felt like I had several MBAs before I was 19. And I never realized actually that there are a couple of quirks in the way, you know, how human the human brain develops. Mm-hmm. It, it's the most underdeveloped organ when we are born uh, because the birth canal is too narrow. So the brain is actually the fastest growing organ in the first five or six years of life. Mm-hmm. And and then from the age of about 10 or 11 till about 20, there is a uh, culling of neuron connections. So the brain actually cuts down uh, the number of connections in that period. And it's ideally set up in that age to specialize. Right. So the problem that we have in our education system is in a modern U.S. education system, from 11 to 18, you are the opposite of a specialist. You are required to be a generalist, you know, generic kind of high school curriculum and all of that. Right. And you get these people like Warren Buffett or Bill Gates or Michelangelo, who by weird circumstances start specializing at 10 or 11. I mean, I think I think Gates had done more than 10,000 hours of programming before he was 19 or 20. And Buffett bought his first talk at 11. And I think even you, you also did that. Mm-hmm. And, and so in my case, what happened is that accidentally I had a lot of business acumen developed in that period of time, which was outside of the school curriculum. Right? Yeah. None of this was part of the school curriculum. And later, uh, what I found is that uh, when I became an engineer and I was working at this, you know, telecom equipment company, I would ask my boss all day, and I was a like a R and D, you know, hardware software design engineer. I would ask my boss all these questions about the business end of the of the stuff we were doing, and he would just say, "That's not our concern. That's these other guys in marketing and uh, sales and whatever else. We are just to design this product and deliver it in this time." And I found that ridiculous. I said, well, I want to know the big picture. I want to know, mm-hmm. you know, what the economics are here and how much money we're going to make and all of that. And I found it like bizarre that there were like these 200 engineers working on stuff and no one had any interest in any of that. Um, and I actually then switched after about two and a half years, I switched to the business side. And of course, mm-hmm. knowing the engineering was a big advantage, but then I could finally start seeing uh, the whole picture and I found, I, I, I didn't realize at the time that very few people could crack businesses or business models as quickly as I could. And it was because of that time when I was a teenager. And so if you try to spend that time in your 20s or 30s, um, you would probably spend five times the amount of time or even more and still not get to the same benefit as what you would get in your teen years. Yeah, that's a very interesting childhood. I'm sure that it developed you in many, many ways. And so at Clemson, you were in, um, you studied engineering and yeah. then left to go work for an IT consulting firm. But in 1991, started your own business with $30,000 from your 401k and $70,000 on credit card debt. And sold that nine years later for $20 million, which is just incredible. Did your experience as an operator affect your investment philosophy and strategy? I'm assuming it did. Well, at that time, you know, uh, when I started my business in 91, I had not yet heard of Warren Buffett. And I did not even know what investing was. Uh, what I understood when I started my business was I, I had all my models for my dad and I knew how to get a business off the ground with zero money. You know, I mean, I can still do that. So my, my dad used to joke and say, he says, you can put me naked on a rock with nothing and I will start a business, you know? And, and so, uh, basically the, I would say the frameworks and mental models I used at that time. Well, things I and you know what I, what what is so natural to me about that, is again what I found is a, a lot of entrepreneurs, don't know how to do that. 
and uh, and I later learned that all these things I kind of take for granted is there because I had this you know front row seat at a time when my brain was just wired to absorb really fast. And my dad had repeatedly given us these lessons. Like I remember the the very first business he started was uh, selling uh, magic kits by mail. Uh, and then this was, uh, this was like 1962 or something. And, uh, and basically it was even before I was born, but he had explained what he had done. He said, look, I took 250 rupees I had, and I placed an ad in a magazine called the illustrated weekly of India. It was a really small display ad, no more than like, you know, four inches by two inches or something explaining that you could order these magic kits by mail and, you know, you could learn to entertain your friends and stuff. Stuff, And he said that from that ad, a bunch of inquiries came in, a bunch of people wanted to buy it. And when the dust settled, he was left with 1,400 rupees. So he put in 250, he sold a bunch of these kits and including the cost of goods sold, including his profit, was 1400 rupees. So then he said, I said, okay, I'm going to place another ad, you know, another Mm -hmm. 250 rupees. And boom, he was, he was in business. Right. And, and he didn't have any expenses because he was, he still had his job. He was running this from his, from the home. My mother would like pack everything to be shipped out. And, you know, so I, I understood how he got all these businesses off the ground with nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, it's really easy to uh, to do that in the IT business. You know, it's a capital light business, so it was fine, not a, not a problem. Yes, and you talk about some of these business models in your book, The Dondo Investor. I should tell my listeners that Monish has published two books, The Dondo Investor, The Low Risk Value Method to High Returns, and Mosaic, Perspectives on Investment Investing. And they're both wonderful books and, and worth reading. Um, so... When you sold your business, how did you become acquainted with the Warren Buffett style of investing and Berkshire Hathaway? Well, so I started the business in 91. In 94, I accidentally heard about Buffett. I was just looking for some book to read on the way back from vacation in London. And uh, I picked up one of Peter Lynch's books and I was really intrigued and I wanted to kind of explore that area. And then I read his second book and then I was out of Peter Lynch books. Yeah. And in the second book, he was talking about this guy Buffett and uh, in kind of reverential terms. And uh, then I started to dig into who this Warren Buffett was. And I was really lucky because the first two or three biographies on him had just come out. And uh, I read those. Then I got to the Berkshire letters. And then that opened up this whole big world. And the big aha moment that went off for me when I read all that was I said, the framework that my dad and I used to start and run a business is really the same mental models you lo- you use to figure out whether an investment makes sense or not. It's really the same. The difference is that when you're doing it in terms of you know creating or running a business, is you have a lot of operational heavy lifting to do. Whereas uh, in investing, you just have to do the analysis and, and you're done. Someone else does all the lifting. And I I always, I knew that I enjoyed this process of figuring out, you know, these offering gaps in the market. But I, I, I found that you would spend like two or three percent of your time figuring out the business strategy or the direction of your startup or whatever. And then 95, 97, 98% of the time is the heavy lifting to make it happen. And I enjoyed the 95, 98%, but I really, really enjoyed the 2 or 3%. Mm-hmm. So what I realized when I read about Buffett is I said, wow, this converts the 2% time to 80%. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to get your hands dirty. So I said this, and you know, I... My my dad passed away soon after that. I never really got a chance to discuss the model with him. I wish he knew mm-hmm. about these things because the two the two are very interrelated, you know. And you know, Buffett says I'm a better investor because I'm a businessman, right? And I'm a better businessman because I'm an investor. So basically, like, anytime I'm looking, 
anytime I'm looking at an, a business or an investment, I put myself in the shoes of the operator, mm-hmm. right? And I look at that business through the shoes of the operator, the shoes of the CEO and say, okay, what are the two or three variables that drive the outcome here? Okay. Mm-hmm. And are those two or three variables predictable? And because no CEO runs a business through a spreadsheet. Right. They've got the models in their head. They've got relatively simple models. Um, I mean, they've understood exactly what their competence is, what their uh, you know competitive advantage is and all of that. And they just hone in on that and keep going. And as long as you as an investor can get to the same models that the CEO is using, using to run the business, you have a basis to figure out where it's going to go. Very interesting. So, um, Manish, there's so many fascinating things occurring in today's markets and that economy today that it's really hard to choose one topic to discuss um, today on the call. We've got asset bubbles unwinding, inflation, geopolitical chaos. Like many of our guests, you've been an active investor for decades now and have the benefit of historical perspective. Um, Do you see an opportunity brewing for value investing and where are you finding opportunities today? Yeah, I mean, I think what what I think is useful for investors is to ignore the noise. Uh, All this macro stuff going on is really hard to forecast and predict. I mean, if we just, you know, go back three years, I mean, who would have thought we'd have a pandemic? And Mm -hmm. who would have thought that Russia is going to invade Ukraine? And, you know, all this, you know, huge stimulus causing all this inflation. All these things were not on anyone's radar, you know, Mm -hmm. and here we are. So I think think the macro stuff is really hard to predict or, you know, have any kind of a, a, a basis for. At the same time, if you look at a, for example, a business like Mao Tai or Starbucks, Mm -hmm. you know, or Microsoft, you know, they are going to transcend all this. Mm -hmm. You know, all this stuff is Mickey Mouse noise for Starbucks. You know, what what matters with Starbucks is, you know, do they still delight their customers? You know, and those the, the micro aspects of what happens around the business. Trump, whatever macro stuff is going on. So right. the micro is Trump. So the important thing always, I think, is to focus on specific businesses within your competence and so on. One of the things, one of the things I realized in the last few years is I I started going to Turkey in uh, Istanbul in Turkey. Uh, about four years ago, mm-hmm. and I made a, I made a few trips. In fact, earlier this year, I spent like three weeks in Istanbul uh, in an Airbnb, which was really good. And um, and I started visiting different businesses. Basically, in in Istanbul, there's a there's a good friend of mine who's a you know hardcore gram oriented mm-hmm. value investor, and he had come to my annual meeting, and we became friends, and so on. So I just told him in 2018, listen, I just want to visit every company that you have an investment in, Mm -hmm. you know, because I I saw that Turkey was very unstable and people were exiting and so on. And, um, And I found a few amazing businesses there uh, where, you know, the core business is great and people have fled because of macro. so I would say probably like 97 or 98 percent of listed businesses in Turkey, I think, are uninvestable because it's mm-hmm. got crazy inflation and all that. Uh, but there's a there's a sliver, two or three percent, that transcend all that, mm-hmm. and they're extremely cheap. And so, so in that case, I would say some understanding of where to fish. Uh, I found useful. And I think we do really well on our Turkey investments. 
Yeah, it's interesting. You know, Uncle John, um, John Templeton, was well known for coming out with these big calls, and they sounded like macro calls, but really he was just focused on areas and regions around the world where he found companies trading at depressed valuations. So is that how, is that similar to how you allocate capital? You're looking at valuations to tell you where to invest in the world? Yeah, I don't, I, you know, what I did with Turkey is not the way I usually approached it, Mm -hmm. you know, though I think that that's a, that's a good way to approach it. I I never really, um, well, I used to be a purely U.S. investor when I started and I was that way for a long time. And then I was starting to find that it's getting harder to find American businesses that, you know, fit, uh, sure. fit kind of competence and valuations and so on. And so I, I noticed, for example, in 2012, when I invested in Fiat Chrysler, you know, it was it was based in Italy and uh, it traded at a much lower valuation than Ford or GM for no good reason. You know, there was no mm-hmm. logic. And in fact, I what I realize is it was a vastly better business than those other two businesses with a much better leader. Mm-hmm. So I said, wow, this is like, I mean, just to give you a sense at that time, uh, Fiat Chrysler market cap was 5 billion and their revenues were 135 billion. Okay. And so they were trading at like, you know, less than four times, I mean, le- less than uh, 4% of revenue. And, uh, Inside that five billion was eighty percent of Ferrari, which now alone is forty billion. Mm-hmm. You know, so Ferrari was this itty bitty thing inside that, and they spun out so many things. They they sold these parts businesses. I mean, anything they spun out was sold for the billions, and all of that was in that five billion. You know, it was just crazy. Uh, the the Jeep franchise and the Ram franchise and all of that. So. Um, yeah, so you get, you, you sometimes get these weird things. And, and in the case of, you know, it was very extreme. Uh, like in 2019, we, uh, we made an investment in this company where, which is the largest warehouse operator in Turkey, you know, 12 million square feet. They've got like about a hundred warehouses, uh, very prime areas in Istanbul and around. And, uh, you could go to any real estate broker, show them that portfolio. And they would tell you in their sleep in six months, they could liquidate the whole thing for something like a billion dollars. Right. There's, there's like, you know, at the time in 2019, I think liquidation value was like 900 million or a billion. There was 200 million of debt. So you're about 700 million net. And the market cap was 20 million. Oh and goodness. I mean, like, you know, you were buying at 3% of liquidation value. I'm not even getting to intrinsic value. I'm getting to liquidation value. And uh, they have actually increased the value of the business in in dollars since then. And wow. uh, we own a third of that business now. Wow. What a ridiculous value. And it's gone up like four or five times in dollars in the last few years, but still cheap. But the thing is that I would never find anything like that here. Sure. You know, right. It's just weird things where the the Turks, the local Turks are gamblers. I mean, the Chinese are gamblers, but the, they got nothing on the Turks. Okay. I did not know that. <laughs> you know, uh, I, met a, I met a CFO of a very large Turkish conglomerate in, uh, in Istanbul. And he's telling me, he says, you know, every country has a national game. He says, like, you know, in Russia, the national game is chess. And the U.S., the national game is poker. And in, in um, China, the national game is baccarat. Mm-hmm. So he says, do you know what the national game in, in Turkey is? I said, why don't you educate me? So he said, the national game in Turkey is backgammon. So he said, like chess that. is purely skill. Uh-huh. Poker is skill and luck. Uh-huh. He says, bakara and backgammon is pure luck. Pure Nothing. luck. Yeah. There's no skill. Okay. And so in Turkey, you have these parlors where these men go and spend the whole afternoon playing bakara. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. and that is when they talk about the Turkish market, they don't talk about investing in the market. They talk about playing the market. So 
80% of the Turkish market is held by insiders or foreigners. Mm -hmm. That doesn't trade much. The 20% is held by locals. It turns over every nine days. Oh my goodness. Uh, The entire 20% turns over every nine days. And most Turks who invest in the local market, they want to invest at 10 o'clock and be done by 2 o'clock. Goodness. Wow. They, they want to buy by 10 and sell by 2 and make their 8% or whatever and then do the same thing the next day. Well, that is certainly not investing the Templeton way. <laughs> <laughs> so, John Templeton so, off talk to holding investment a, 200 years. <laughs> there's a quote by Buffett. He says, you know, the stock market is a mechanism to transfer wealth. Uh-huh. From the active to the inactive. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great I, I don't think Warren has been to Turkey or understands Turkey, but I think it fits that. I mean, I was, what I was shocked at is this $20 million business. I thought I wouldn't even get 50,000 of stock. Okay. Because I said, this would be some illiquid nonsense that I'm never going to be able to buy. Right. And there's massive volume, unbelievable volume. I was shocked at the volume. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Well, we, we're seeing lots of opportunities in international markets. I mean, international markets are very depressed compared to the U.S. market. Are you still allocating capital to India? Yeah, we. I mean, I got a little bit sidetracked because we couldn't go anywhere for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I can't really invest in India or Turkey or anywhere until I meet the, you know, kick the tires, meet the people, management, all of that, right? Mm-hmm. So that was really kind of kiboshed with the with the pandemic. And now we're getting back on track. Uh, I haven't had any new investments uh, that have come up in India. Um, I, I, I found a couple of uh, great businesses in Turkey earlier this year. So, so that is, I mean, I, I actually think that if I were, if I were starting out with a small amount of capital, I would put all my time and energy into Turkey. Yeah. Because that's just the way that market is. I mean, you know, we have uh, like, there's a, there's a company, I don't have an investment in this company yet, but and I don't know if I will, but there's a company called Dogus Automotive that imports all the VW brands into Turkey. So they have a monopoly on, Volkswagen and Porsche and Bentley and all the other brands that VW has. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the car business is useless, but the car dealership business is great. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially the parts and service, you know, that does exceptionally well. But because they are a sole importer, uh, nobody competes with them on the price of a new VW. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, they, and they have a very, great relationship with VW. So what I'm saying is that that's kind of like one of those franchises that just does, and you know, it's like 14% market share uh, of VW brands in Turkey. So it's just, you get these businesses and they're trading at like three times earnings type things. And it's really good. Very, very interesting. I would love for you to spend just a minute or two talking about your philanthropic endeavors. Uh, the Doc Shana Foundation, which I have been very impressed with. you kind enough to send me your annual report every year, which is really well done and produced. Um, if you could tell everyone what the Doc Shana Foundation is, what your goal is, how you became inspired to fund the Doc Shana Foundation, and the important work you're doing in India. Yeah, well, I think you might find a lot of this resonance with your with your grand uncle. You know, mm-hmm. he he did a great job with philanthropy, and I think the issue is that if 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 you are any good at investing, like Buffett says, you can't help but get rich. And at the end, we can't take it with us. And actually, giving it to your gene pool, large inheritances to your gene pool, is just going to do more harm than good. Yeah. Uh, like I think Buffett says, if you're Jesse Owen's son, you know, the sprinter, it's okay to start 100 meter dashes at the 10 meter line, but not at the 40 meter line. Right. You know, you're not going to become a great sprinter starting at the 40 meter line. And, uh, and so if you're going to not give it to your gene pool and you're going to, you know, give it back to society, uh, I really was disillusioned when I started looking a few years back. I said, okay, if I had to do this today, who would I give the money to? 
I really wanted to just write a check. Mm-hmm. And I really found that cha- most charities have really great hearts, but they are not, uh, they don't have great heads. Right. Uh, they don't understand social return on invested capital and mm-hmm. how to get, uh, how to measure outcomes and all those sorts of things. Right. And so I was actually really forced to start, start Dakshna out of like necessity because I said, I nearly need to learn this piece and become good at it so that by the time I'm 70 or 80 and, you know, losing half my marbles, I'm not, you know, just looking to write a big check and be done because I will probably do a worse job then than today. And so Dakshna was really set up as a way to experiment and, and hopefully if the wealth grew to scale up over time. And so we, uh, we identify very gifted, but really poor kids uh, in India. And we try to get them admitted into the IITs, which is the kind of the MIT of India. Right. So these schools are really good, but they and they are almost free to attend. They are subsidized by the government, but they're very difficult to get into. And mm-hmm. it had it had turned into such that unless you were middle class or higher, more like upper middle class, you really couldn't afford the coaching and the prep to take the exam. And so even though the government set it up to be egalitarian across, you know, the, uh, you know, make it for all the people, it really became, became for middle class and higher. And so what we did is we basically leveled the playing field. We identify really poor kids and then we basically bring them in for one or two years for intense prep. And it's been, it's worked really well. The IITs have like a one, one and a half percent admit rate. And we have like a 70, 80% success rate. Unbelievable. Now, how many kids do you work with every year? We typically take about a thousand kids a year and about seven or 800 of them get to the promised land. And even the rest of them, they get to second tier colleges, which are also pretty good. Do you have a particularly inspiring story to share with us about one of your students that you've helped along the way? No, every year I visit the homes of the scholars. So we have we have many, many stories, but we have we like there's one one kid who's now in Mountain View with Google. And uh, you know, when when he was growing up, his dad his dad is a tailor, but he's a tailor kind of in a slum of Hyderabad. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of like an entrepreneur. So, you know, just depends on whether he got any tailoring jobs that day or not. So sometimes when they would go to bed, all they would have is some boiled rice. And sometimes when they go to bed, they couldn't even have boiled rice. Like they'd go to bed hungry. Right. And uh, sometimes he got sent back from school because they couldn't pay the school fees, which was 20 rupees. 20 rupees is 25 cents. Mm-hmm. You know, monthly school fee of 25 cents, even that his parents couldn't pay. And, and this is a private school or is this the school through your foundation? No, these this is like a like a government or a oh, private right. school. Like yeah. a, but private is also very low end. It's private yes, schools. Yes, but private schools are very hours. common in India. Even yeah. um, very poor children attend private schools in India. Yeah. And uh, and so we we he cleared our test and then we took him on. And you know, the IITs, they have about 1.3 million kids who apply to get in for like 15,000 seats. Uh, and there's a very tough entrance exam and you get ranked like rank one, two, mm-hmm. three, and so on. He was ranked 63. So 63 out of one and a half, 1.3 million. And, uh, and, and then he went to IIT Bombay computer science. And then when he was going to graduate, I, I, I told him, listen, uh, just send your resume to Google by email Mm -hmm. and just make sure you just put your IIT rank. Forget (laughs) everything else. Just put your IIT G rank. That's it. Whoever whoever that Google is reading it is probably IIT grad anyway. Yeah. And um, they interviewed (laughs) him over Skype and then they brought him over to the (laughs) States. And the thing is that, you know, so his family used to be at like, you know, in a good month, like $70 a month, you know, $2 a day type of thing. Yeah. I mean, I think he's 
he's risen so much now. He's like level six. Oh I think goodness. he must be like north of three or four hundred thousand a year. Wow, what a success! It's like it's not even like even he cannot. He says like the first paycheck he got exceeded the sum total of all paychecks or savings of his family for like decades. You know, Monish, that's really a wonderful story, and uh, I think it's such a great thing that you're contributing back through the Dakshana Foundation. And if my listeners want to learn more about Dakshana, about your books, about your investment funds, what is the best way they can contact you? What is the best way they can learn more? The best way is to go to God Google. God Google will tell you everything. <laughs> okay. You know, well, the ultimate God. There you go. You heard it from from the horse's mouth. Go to Google and it will direct you to Monish. Monish, you've been very kind to my husband and I over the years. You're always so friendly. Include us in so many things. And I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. It has been a pleasure having you on today. It has been a pleasure getting to know you and your beautiful daughter. I haven't met the other one, but I'm sure she is beautiful as well. And um, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you maybe in Omaha next year. Yeah. And I think for me, uh, Lauren, the thing is that I learned so much from Sir John. And it was uh, very special to have your friendship. And you had, a, you know, you obviously had a great connection with your dad, who's a good, very good investor, but also with your great uncle. Mm-hmm. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I think just, to be able to, you know, interact with someone who knew him so well, it's just wonderful. Oh, thank you. I really miss him a lot, um, but feel like I'm helping keep his legacy alive through my work as chairing the John Templeton Foundation. Um, so I'm deeply involved in his philanthropic efforts and just trying to keep a good thing going. So thank you so much for those kind words and and for joining me today. All right. That sounds great. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Investing the Templeton Way. Please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. To view the show notes and resources mentioned in today's show, head to investingthetempletonway.com. 